Bam, 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 Chathams. Diddly doo. So, Chathams. And this is the video I've been most looking forward to in this series because it's the one I can almost spend the least amount of time discussing the class. Don't get me wrong, there's going to be a lot of discussion of the Chatham class and their subclass of the towns and what they get up to in this video. But it's not as important as explaining the point, which is what I've been building to through the whole of the Scout Cruisers and now the Light Cruisers as the Ron they've developed them. The fact that we, as naval historians and naval current affairs experts, lie shamelessly, regularly, loudly. Hmm. Maybe not lie so much as do a gross oversimplification, perhaps. You could say it's a lie by uh, simplification. What is this lie? We call it the high-low mix. In fact, the high-low mix is often a lie whenever anyone brings it up. The idea is you have this kernel of very powerful, very critical high-tech equipment around which a vast wave of low-tech equipment is arranged. Or a kernel of warfighting, highly capable warships around which a vast wave of low capability warships are arranged, and they'll be added to as they need to be. It's not that way. It never is that way. But it's a nice simplification you can use to sort of explain to politicians and explain to other people what it means. And it works in that regards. But it's a lie if we use the Age of Sail, which is often brought up as a perfect period of high-low mix. And even I myself sometimes engage in this because it makes life easy to engage, to use it as simple. It's a foundational lie which we can use to explain other points in a way that makes it nice and easy to explain and provides the listener and the audience and the student with something they can grasp onto. But the reality in Age of Sail is that if we're talking the highest of high, we're talking first rates. If we're talking the lowest of low, we're talking unrated vessels. Yet the vast majority of vessels in fleets, in battle fleets, are third rates. They're not the highest. Their name specifically tells you they are the third from highest in tech, in size, in all the other things. They are not the highest. They're third rates. And whilst the sick freights and unrated vessels, especially unrated with the brigs, are incredibly important and incredibly numerous, when we think of frigate actions, we think of fifth freights as a rule. They're the ones which provide the majority of the forces for frigate actions. And therefore, by definition, they're not the lowest because they're fifth rates and there is sick rates and unrated below them. What are these vessels? They're the squidgy middle. They're the reality. You're building dreadnoughts. They are wonderful. They are all conquering. They are all powerful. They are behemoths. You're building battle cruisers. They're amazing. They can't be everywhere. You might have this all-powerful fleet, this na 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 which will turn up and blow you up. And you might have, if you're you know, an opponent, and you might be able to send around the world, most of the time, these little sloops which are armed with whatever the armed salesman had going on special that day, just enough to defend themselves, to turn up and go, mm-hmm, stop that, because whilst I am not a casus belli because I am so weak, you touch me. One hair on my head and na 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 boom arrives. 
Well, that's lovely in theory. In practice, as I've talked about before, you need a gradated response, which means you need the middle, which means you need the cruisers, which are the vessels, which are not the capital ships, but they're not the sloops. They're the middle. In this case, they're the light cruisers of the town class, and the Chathams are especially good at this. But there is another reason you want these ships. Not their displacement, not their 25 knot speed, which gives them a significant advantage over the dreadnoughts, get a dreadnought battleships, and gives them an upper speed they can maintain contact and maintain operations with most battle cruisers. No, not that. It's not even the eight six inch 50 caliber guns, which allow them to engage destroyers, well, let's torpedo about destroyers at this time, or other cruisers in a way which is frankly fairly scary for those. No. Even the armor. As useful as it is, is not on its own. What is, is the whole combination means that those merchant surface raiders, which can be built, which can probably take down most sloops, are not going to be enough firepower to take on these. And in peacetime, they have the presence mission of being able to turn up when a sloop won't do, when you don't want to have to deploy an actual military force. And if they do, if you do send a sloop, they might consider it the sign of weakness and, deploy, and actually sink it. So you want something bigger, which can turn up and go, Really? You're going to try and take on me? You're going to mess with me? No? Go home. You're talking about, in wartime, the world's largest empire that they had ever seen. An empire held together by maritime, by arteries, by sea sinews, by all those things. It's necessities of war fighting, of commerce, everything had to go by sea. You could not be everywhere you needed to be with battle cruisers. You were not going to have enough. And sloops weren't going to be enough on their own. Enter the light cruiser, or rather the cruiser which we're building, which is not a battle cruiser. So we're going to call it a light cruiser. And for some reason, we're not going to adopt a Dreadnought style with it. We are going to continue with an almost pre-Dreadnought stylings. Which is interesting, but, you know, it works. Be gone with turbines. And this is HMS Chatham, which illustrates beautifully in its picture one of the real capabilities of this class. You will notice she has three guns which can fire forward. So that's three of her eight guns can fire forward, directly forward, which is fairly decent. Let's be honest, if three of your eight guns can fire forward, you've got a fairly good forward firing capacity. And if you're in the forward arcs, you could be, and a certain alignments, could theoretically, although highly unlikely, get as many as six guns pointed at you. But the vast majority of the time, if you're outside of the forward arcs, you will have five guns pointed at you, including if you're directly behind the ship. Because, as you'll notice, the waste guns can fire over the aft guns, theoretically, if one wants to move some boats and do some creative manoeuvring of things in battle. And you could therefore have five guns firing sternwards. This is a very well-balanced design. It has the engine power, and it has a huge amount of engines for its size. It has the speed, it has the range, and it has the firepower. Chatham herself? Well, she is laid down in January 1911. She's helpful enough by the Royal, for the Royal Navy, built at Chatham Dockyard, which is, of course, the Royal Navy's own dockyard, and named Chatham. She's launched November 1911 and commissioned December 1912. She won't be scrapped till July 1926. She was first assigned to 2nd Battle Squadron and then transferred to 2nd Light Cruiser Squadron Mediterranean in July 1913. She was part of the Mediterranean fleet at the outbreak of the First World War and initially took part in the search for Gerben and Breslau, and in the Straits of Messina. However, in August 1914, she was detached for operations in the Red Sea. Now, this is always an interesting time, but for her, 
This involved her being intimately involved in the story of Königsberg, President and Somali. Now, the light cruiser, the Königsberg, had sunk the Pegasus in Zanzibar Harbour in September of 1914. And so Chatham was ordered to East Africa to join up with Weymouth and Dartmouth, two other town class cruisers, and hunt for Königsberg. Chatham's captain, Sidney R. Drew Lau, was in command of the operation. Now, she arrived at Zanzibar on the 20th of September, but unfortunately runs aground on the 1st of October. She's quickly repaired at Mombasa, and by 19th of October, Chatham's boats had found the steamer, the German steamer, the President, three and a half miles upriver from the coastal town of Lind in German, Lind in German East Africa, now Tanzania. Now, the Germans, of course, claimed that President was a hospital ship. However, there's a problem with claiming a ship's hospital ship. It had better have some medical equipment on board. And the British found no medical equipment on board. And as they hadn't been notified about President's status, and actually found documents which indicated she'd acted as a supply ship for Königsberg, they claimed her as a prize of war. However, President's engines were broken down, so instead they settled for disabling her machinery before beginning and continuing her search for Königsberg. The idea being that if anyone really wanted her, they could come back and get her. On the 30th of October, Chatham found Königsberg and her supply ship, Somali, holed up in the Rafiji River. Unfortunately, there's a very shallow river delta there, and whilst their draft is a 4.9 metres in mean, it's shallower than that. So, they couldn't approach the two ships closely. However, on the 7th of November, well, Chatham managed to hit Somali with a shell, which caused a fire that destroyed the supply ship. This is her picture. And on the 10th of November, the British managed to sc uh, scuttle the Collier Newbridge in the main channel delta, which blocked Königsberg herself from being able to skip to sea. This allowed Chatham to be free to go wandering, and she would return back to the Mediterranean. She had a good time there. And her career would include acting as flagship for Rear Admiral John de Roebuck, uh, during the landing at Silver Bay and acting as flagship for Admiral Weymouth during the evacuation of Silver Bay and Anzac Cove. She'd even, in 1916, strike a mine off Norfolk coast and has to be towed back to Chatham for repairs. She's placed in reserve in 1918, but is lent to the New Zealand Division of Royal Navy from 1920 to 1924, and actually takes part in the search for the missing steamer, the SS Castonia. What is cool, and is worthwhile remembering, is that the reason why the New Zealand Football Association has, as its premier football trophy, the Chatham Cup, is because the crew of Chatham, HMS Chatham, they needed a cup to them. So, there you go, the history of the Chatham Cup. Ah, HMS Dublin. Now... She's a pretty vessel. She is a really pretty vessel. And she has an interesting career as well. She's also laid down January 1911. She's built by William Beardmore and Company in Dalmuir, which is in, of course, Glasgow. I'm not sure why they didn't build Dublin. In Ireland, at least. I don't think you can really build it in Dublin at this point. But you could have built it in Belfast. And she's launched the 30th of April 1912, commissioned March 1913. Now, she has a pretty darn interesting career. Her career, of course, again includes the pursuit of the Goman, because she also managed to end up in first the 1st Battle Squadron in 1913, and then the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron operating the Mediterranean. 
It's almost as if the Royal Navy goes, hang on, we're going to need some very useful ships in the Mediterranean in any forthcoming war in 1913 and goes, hmm, Chatham class, you have those 50 caliber six inch guns, don't you? Yes, you have eight of them, don't you? Yes, you can theoretically use five eighths of your armament or, well, let's be honest. 5 eighths is 62.5% of your firepower on pretty much most of your angles of operation. Yes? Well, don't we have a good deal for you? You're going to be great in the Mediterranean. And send them there. Now, she was under the command of Captain John Kelly and took part in the pursuit of Goban. But, of course, didn't really catch up. In fact, on the 6th of August, after having completed coaling, Dublin left Malta at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to join Rear Admiral Trowbridge's squadron. At 8.30 at night, that's 20.30 hours, she received orders to obtain Goban's course and sink her during the night by torpedoes if possible. Again, these ships have a single launch each side 21-inch torpedo. A single 21-inch torpedo is not going to do the damage they were expecting it to. Now, she spent her time observing in the distance, and Kelly, that's Captain Kelly, decided to engage around 0330 hours. But Goban unexpectedly altered course to north. The chase was lost as a daylight attack was quite realised to be quite suicidal, as Goban's largest guns could accurately fire explosive shells up to, well, 10 miles or 16 kilometres away, and the lovely gun they're on has a maximum firing range at 22.5 degrees, which is what really they could reach at this point, of 16,000 meters or 16 kilometers. So, yeah. Their theoretical firing range was 16 kilometers, which is theoretically the same as Goban's largest guns. The trouble is, Goban is armed with far bigger guns. And the impact of 11-inch guns on a town-class light cruiser would be, at best for the crew, a significant emotional event. At worst for the crew, would punch very large holes through the hull, possibly go off if it hit the, it hit the actual machinery, and split the ship in half. So, no. However, her Mediterranean career was by no means going to be uninventful. In fact, she was going to have quite an eventful one. She managed to get torpedoed by the Austro-Hungarian. And I do realise there is an A instead of an O there, but... Microsoft Office, I love you. Austro-Hungarian submarine U-4. Now, this was while taking a part in a sweep off the Albanian coast and escorted by French and Italian destroyers. She's hit and damaged by a torpedo. She was able to get her underway, though, at 17 knots. So, if you consider her top speed is 25 and a half knots in theory, and she's still making 17 knots, she's not doing too bad. And she returned to Brinsey, and then eventually had to return to the UK for refit to be repaired from it. Once home, she served in the second light cruiser squadron alongside Southampton, Birmingham, Nottingham in the Grand Fleet. Under the command of Albert Charles Scott, captain at the point, uh, later gone to become vice admiral, she participated in the Battle of Jutland in 1916 and she fired 117 six-inch shells, attacked and sank a destroyer, and sustained severe damage alongside Southampton, but her and Southampton basically 
were critical ships during the battle. And again, we often think about, well, we often forget to think about the role of these medium ships in these battles. We talk about the actions of the big capital ships and what they're doing. We forget that the light cruisers are wandering around fighting a battle just as fierce, if not fiercer. Then we have Southampton. Ah, oh, Southampton. Southampton has a pretty darn interesting career. She's laid down in April 1911. She is launched in May 1912 and commissioned in November 1912. She would spend her career either being assigned to 1st Battle Squadron and being part of its escort, or in 1st Light Cruiser Squadron. She's the flagship of that. Then she's the flagship of the second light cruiser squadron, and then she's the flagship, well, sometimes flagship, sometimes not, of the eighth light cruiser squadron. She has an extensive career. In the Battle of Jutland, she torpedoed the light cru the German light cruiser SMS SS SS of Fraunhof, which is, of course, subsequently sunk. Sinks. Southampton, living up to the name and tradition of Southamptons. But this is not the battle where she really had the most critical involvement. And I would argue, leading the light cruisers, she had a very critical involvement in an earlier fight. Now, if we read from Beatty's own dispatch, he notes, The first light cruiser squadron maintained an excellent position on the port quarter of the enemy's line, enabling them to observe and keep touch or attack any vessel that might fall out of line. They were also in a good position to mark the effect of our fire and fall of shot. Southampton reported that one ship, probably Tiger, was firing consistently over. This might have enabled her to correct her range. In fact, the light cruisers, the whole way through, are holding things together. Sometimes they're the second light cruiser squadron are holding things together. Sometimes it's the first light cruiser squadron. And so, i.e. sometimes it's the forces of Twirt, which had come up from Harwich. Sometimes it's the forces which were attached to the, uh, to the battle cruiser force as a whole. And it's quite an interesting thing to read through and find out. But what also you realise is that throughout the whole of this battle, the light crews and destroyers of the British are constantly trying to fulfil orders. They're trying to repeat commands. They are trying to be of service. But they also have to think through what they're doing. When BT gives an order, pass ahead to cover this position, he gets the orders back and the message back, we can't do that without obscuring your guns. So we have to go around. And you see far more pushback, to an extent, of Beatty within this force from the light cruisers and from the ships of the destroyer flotillas than necessary from the from the battle cruiser force. Going, you can't do that. Are you quite sure about that signal? And you start to realize the relationship is not of subservient servants. They're not the low in this mix. They are, yes lower than the battle cruisers, but they are powerful, they are pertinent, and they are led by some very strong personalities, and they have to be very capable ships which have to think through what they're doing. They can't just hazard their ship recklessly. They're not an expendable item. They're not, therefore, low in the high-low mix. Not that anything, any ship really is ever expendable, but let's be honest, if you have to choose between losing a flower class corvette in World War II or HMS King George V, an admiral won't be happy with, himself, with themselves for doing it, but it won't be a long conversation in their mind. They'll try and look for a way to avoid losing either, but if the choice is one or the other and that's their only way to go, flower class is going to get it. 
this is despite the fact that King George V actually probably could survive a torpedo hit or a damage far better than a flower class. But you don't want King George V out of work for that long amount of time. Whereas a flower class, you can build a new one. Ah, oh, HMS Sydney. Now, HMAS Sydney is a special vessel. She is built by the London and Glasgow Engineering and Iron Shipbuilding Company. She is laid down in February 1911, launched August 1912, and commissioned June 1913. She has a very interesting operational career. When she arrived in Albany, Western Australia, on 19 September 1913, after completing a maiden voyage, she was greeted with great celebration. And in March 1914, she sailed to Singapore to meet the two new Australian submarines, AE-1 and AE-2. She then nursed them back home. This is a picture of her nursing those submarines back home to Sydney. When World War I started, Sydney was on a northbound trip to join Admiral George Patey in the battle cruiser HMS Australia. The ships were quickly assigned to protect the Naval and Military Expeditionary Force, uh, which under the pre-war plans and under the plans being executed was going to capture German colonial assets in the region. Basically, Britain was reusing its Napoleonic war strategy. Right then, so we're fighting continental power. Let's hoover up their colonies around the world. This is not how we gained a massive empire. Sydney participated in a range of operations uh, against Rabul, Anger Islands in September. And then in October 1914, she and Melbourne left Patey's squadron and went to Sydney to join the first convoy delivering soldiers to Egypt. Now, when they were on this convoy, they had some interesting times. Because on the morning of 9th of November, the island of Cocos and the communication station on Direction Island in the Cocos Island group was captured by the SMS Endon. Before it was captured, however, the station transmitted an SOS. This was received by the troop convoy and Sydney's order to investigate. Now, please note, this is not a good convoy for the Endon to be anywhere near. Why do I say that? Because at different points, this convoy has had the Japanese armoured cruiser, semi-battle cruiser, escorting it, HMS Minotaur, Yes, those armoured cruisers built for the Royal Navy in 1906. Uh, not exactly small vessels. And also, has Melbourne and Sydney there. And let's be honest, Endem is not in any of those vessels' class. She really isn't. She's a lovely ship, but she's armed with... 10 4.1 inch guns. It's not going to be pretty. Those are also 40 caliber 4, in, uh, uh, four inch guns. 50 ca versus 50 caliber 6 inch guns. Uh, their maximum firing range, and this is at 30 degrees elevation, is roughly 12,000 meters. So. That's maximum firing range, and that's not going to be your really maximum accurate range. You can kind of guess what's going to happen next. So, the signal has arrived. The convoy is heard. We've been taken. Now, here is the real problem for the Germans, because wherever they go in the world, they transmit at full blast. And 
they presume everyone else transmits always at full blast. The Germans knew Minotaur had heard the wireless call and acknowledged. But the signal strength they read indicated that Minotaur was at least 10 hours away. Now, at this point, the commander, well, the first of, of the forces ashore for Emden, um, the first officer, Helmuth von Mook, who's making the decision, asked the gentleman in charge of the station, Ducky, uh, Darcy Farrant, to surrender the keys to the station's building, any weapons, and the superintendent just hands them over and goes, yep, yeah, here they are. Oh, and uh, the Kaiser had an, has announced awards for your actions at Penang. So, the German staff and personnel begin smashing their transmitting equipment and severing two of the station's free under CU cables plus a dummy cable. They missed the third one. They felled the main wireless mast, although they did take care of the request of the staff to avoid damaging the station's tennis quarters. That was really important. And... Just as up there with the loss of cheese on certain battleships in World War Two, the mast landed on a cache of Scotch whiskey. The sacrifice. The trauma. Anyway. At 0900 hours, Emden saw smoke from an approaching ship. They assumed this to be the Burresk. By 0915 hours, they realized an approaching warship. And they think it's HMS Newcastle, or another vessel of similar vintage, i.e. another town-class cruiser. Either way, Newcastle is not exactly a town-class cruiser which Emden wants to be messing with. So Emden, though, cannot really go away because her shore party are still ashore. They signal them to hurry up, and they start to prepare for battle. At 0930 hours, they'd raised anchor and decide to sail to meet the approaching ship, leaving Von Mook's party behind. There's no other choice. Now, please do remember that Emden, when she's at best, has a top speed of 24 and a half knots. This is when she has been recently refitted, has got a clean hull, and everything is working as it should be. By this point, she's been a home and away from infrastructure maintenance for many, many months. She is not going to be able to reach 24 and a half knots. In fact, I'm surprised if she can top 21. In contrast, Sydney has had regular repairs, regular refits, regular support and maintenance. So yeah, she can make her 25 knots. There is not really much chance of them getting away at 0900 hours in the morning. It's just not, there's too much daylight. Now, at this point, the convoy hears more signals. And believing that Emden has summoned support, Melbourne's captain, that is HMAS Melbourne, Sydney's sister, another town class, orders his ship to make full speed and turn for Cocos. So now you have Theoretically, two ships heading in. Ibuki offers to go in instead. But no. No. Silver goes, no, please stay, don't follow Sydney. She'll handle it. And 0915 hours, the same point as the party ashore and the Emden had identified the approaching ship as an approaching warship, Sydney spots 
Direction Island. They spot the attacking ship. And her captain, Glossop, orders the ship to prepare for action. They decide to open at rain, uh, open fire at 9,500 yards, that's 8,700 meters, which is well within Sydney's effective firing range. But believed to be outside the effective, not the theoretical, the effective firing range of Emden's guns. Emden fired first, firing 0940 hours, scoring hits on her four salvo. These shots landed on Sydney at a range of approximately 10,000 yards or 9,100 meters. So, 400 meters beyond the believed effective firing range of her guns, but still nowhere near the actual theoretical maximum range. This was done with a 30 degree elevation of her main guns. Now, Von Muller, the captain of Emden, realised that his only chance was to do as much damage as possible before the other ship retaliated. However, the high angle of guns to achieve the range, the narrow profile presented by Sydney as she was boring in, meant that only 15 shells hit the Australian warship before she started open fire. And only five of those exploded, again, because of the angle of impact. And whilst damage was sustained, four sailors were killed, another 16 wounded. These are the only casualties aboard Sydney during the entire engagement. Sydney decides to open the gap between these two ships. However, she'd lost both of her rangefinders, which meant that she couldn't really open the range that much, and required each mounting to be targeted and fired locally. Okay, you're depending upon your gun crews. And please note, the Japanese are get fairly obsessed with this battle. This is one of the paintings they produce of it. They're really impressed by the Australians, and honestly, it becomes a sort of thing about Australian ships being hard-fighting, worthy warriors in Japanese culture, and this is one of the interesting things you have coming out of World War One in the treaty system. If the Australians had been allowed to retain a battle cruiser or some sort of equivalent vessel, i.e. let's say they got Tiger, or let's say the Royal Navy had been some freak way uh, built an extra couple of an extra couple of Admiral class battle cruisers and Renowner and Pulse have been going. They, if they had a battle cruiser, that would have been figured very heavily in any Japanese war plans. Yes, the Japanese would have decided to send something to try and sink it early on, but that would have meant either detaching forces from the Pearl Harbor strike, or would have meant having to send a special force and using fuel to send a force down to find and take out the battle cruiser. And it all stems back to this battle. Unsurprisingly, the rangefinder's gone. The first two salvos missed. But two shells from the third struck, one exploding in Emden's wireless office, another by the German's forward gun. At this point, the six-inch guns really start to bear their superior penetrating capability and the sheer amount of damage they can do when they go off meant that, plus the fact that Sydney had more armour, um, destroyed Endon steering gear, rangefinders, voice pipes, the turrets and engineering, and knocked out several of the guns. The forward funnel collapses. The foremast falls and crushes the forebridge. A shell from Sydney actually landed in the aft ammunition room, of Emden, and the Germans had to flood it, which meant they lost access to the aft ammunition. Once you flood a magazine, you lost it. At 10.20 hours, the ships were within 5,000 meters of each other. So Glossop, being of a positive bent, decides to order torpedo firing. 
Torpedo failed to cover the distance and sank without exploding. At this point, he speeds up his ship, turns to starboard so that the guns that had yet to fire can engage. All this fighting so far being done with his port guns. Emden matched Sydney's turn, but by this point, the second funnel had been blasted off, and there was a fire in the engine room. Half of the cruiser's personnel had been killed or wounded, and the, uh, mm, there were no reserves to take their places, as those reserves were all ashore on Direction Island, going, Our ship's getting sunk. By 1100 hours, this is after an hour and 20 minutes of fighting, only one of Emden's guns still firing. The third funnel goes overboard, and Emden was close to North Keeling Island. At this point, to save his crew's lives, Von Muller ordered the ship to beach there. She runs aground at 1120 hours. At this point, Sydney ceases fire. And she sends a message back to the convoy. Emden beached and done for. As a result, the soldiers aboard the troop ships were granted a half-day holiday from duties and training to celebrate. That's nice. At which point they then went after the Buresque, which of course was supposed to be, in, theoretically, assisting the Emden. But we'll leave that to another time. HMS Melbourne. Almost so close to being part of the destruction of the Emden, but actually at this point, technically covering a convoy and going, mm -hmm. could have been me. Doing my duty, though. Melbourne is special. For starters, Melbourne is the only town cruiser for which I know something rather large still survives. Now, she has a slightly different career. Laid down April 1911, she is built by Camel Lairds, the premier shipbuilders. She is launched the 30th of May 1912 and commissioned 18th of January 1913. She has a motto, Veris Aquet Enundo, and she has battle honours. Now, these have been added later because, at the time, the Australians didn't consider them proper battle honours. But when they reorganised themselves, they finally went, you know what? She fought in the North Sea. That's a battle honour. And Rabul, of course, is a battle honour. She's the first cruiser launched for the Royal Australian Navy. And the first completed. That was ordered entirely the whole way through by the Royal Australian Navy. She is, of course, launched by Mrs. F.F. F. Brond, daughter of the Australian philanthropist Robert Barr Smith. Now, her completion? Well, she sailed from Portsmouth to Fremantle. 10th of March, 19, arriving there on 10th of March, 1913. And until August 1914, her primary role was training cruises and port visits around Australia. She was the Australian Navy as far as the Australian people were concerned. She operated with Australian warships in the Pacific during August and September, um, trying to counter the German East Asia Squadron and capturing German colonies, basically hoovering them up. And then, as mentioned, she goes and joins Sydney in escorting the Australian New Zealand Army Corps to Egypt. She has an interesting career. In fact, she'll be involved in operations throughout World War I. She was fitted with an aeroplane platform system in November 1917 and launched her aircraft after sighting German aircraft over Heligoland Blight in 1918. Unfortunately, the pilot lost his bearings, in, his bearings in the clouds and his target, and returned to Melbourne empty-handed. 
After the surrender of the German high sea fleet, she escorted SMS Nuremberg across. She remained with the ground fleet until November 1918. As said, doesn't get battle honors rewarded till 2010, but that doesn't matter because part of us still survives, and that is this. If you go to the Australian Fleet Air Arm Museum, not the British Fleet Air Arm Museum, the Australian one, you will find her gun. You will find one of her six inch guns on display. Now, on her way home from the UK, she sailed to Sydney via Suez, Singapore, and Darwin. She's paid off to reser into reserve in August 1919 until April 1920 when she's recommissioned. She rescued personnel in 1922 from the Helen B. Sterling, which had been disabled in Tasman Sea by a gale, a sailing ship. And then she was assigned to, as flagship of the Australia Squadron. She went back in reserve into 1924. She was finally recommissioned in October 1925 and left Sydney for England in November that year. During 1926, she was assigned to Mediterranean Fleet on exchange and then returned in August 1926 to resume her duties as flagship. In 1928, she took part in her last voyage to England. She arrived in the UK on 12 April. She was decommissioned final time on 23rd of April, with her ship's company being assigned to the very brand new HMAS Australia. And she herself is sold to a breaking company for £25,000. But luckily, this survives! Which is rather cool to go see. Finally, we have HMAS Brisbane. Now... She has a good career. Her battle honours include the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And her motto is one of the coolest ones. Conjunctus verbus, or with united strength. She is built at Cockatoo Island Dockyard. Yes, she's one of those rare vessels built by the Australians in Australia at this time. And she is a good and useful ship. Now, she is laid down in January 1913, launched September 1915, and commissioned October 1916, completed December 1916, and decommissioned September 1935. So, she had a real shot of making World War II, strangely enough. I'm not sure what an upgraded town-class cruiser of the 1910 type would have been used for in World War II, I can't see them being getting uh, much. Uh, you could probably do an AA upgrade to them like you did with the C-Class, but honestly, the C-Class are probably better for the upgrade than the Town Class are. They're just a little bit older and a little bit smaller than the C-Class. Hmm. In December 1916, she departed on a voyage to the Mediterranean after reaching Malta on the 4th of February. She's fitted with equipment not available in Australia. Yeah, there you go. There's equipment not available in Australia. So they built the ship, but the equipment hasn't made it out to Australia. But it's made it to Malta, and the Royal Navy can fit it in Malta. After this, she redeploys to Colombo, and is employed on Indian Ocean patrols to search for the Wolf and Seedler. In 1917, February, she gets a Sopwith baby. And this is the first aircraft to be used by a Royal Australian Navy ship. She spent most of her World War I period in the Indian Ocean. Doing the patrols, being the necessary presence, and being the necessary... How do I put this? Empire presence. She spent her interwar years, i.e., well, when I say interwar years, her period in the 1920s and 1930s, going in and out of reserve. In 1919, when she departed from Portsmouth for home, 
she caught up with HMS Pla- AS Platypus and the six J-class submarines, which have been transferred to the Royal, uh, Royal Australian Navy, and relieved HMS Sydney as their escort. J-5 was experiencing problems, so Brisbane took her under tow, and the two vessels reached Sydney on 27th of June. She operated on Australian waters for the next three years until she was decommissioned to reserve. She's reactivated in April 1923, but she runs aground off Port Mosby in New Guinea in 1924. From February until August 1925, she served with the China Squadron as part of an exchange. And while she was there, she became the first Royal Australian Navy ship to visit Japan. Yes, she was the first Royal Australian Navy ship to visit Japan. She's placed back into reserve in October to undergo a refit, but is recommissioned in November of 1924-25 to to act as a training ship attached to Flinders Naval Depot. She then has a longer decommissioned refit between 1926 and June 1928, and she resumes her training duties. In August 1928, she visited Hawaii, and was present for the celebrations commemorating the 150th anniversary of the island's discovery. Remember, that's the island's discovery by Cook, not by the islanders. History is fun. She was decommissioned again in August 1929. Brisbane was commissioned for last time in April 1935, and she did this specifically to carry the new ship's company for HMAS Sydney to Britain. She assisted Hastings in various issues, uh, that's HMS Hastings, a sloop, various issues on the way, but when she reaches Portsmouth in July 1935, she's decommissioned, and she's the last coal-fueled cruiser operational in any part of the British Empire. Good ships, aren't they? The Chatham class have an eventful career, but they are the middle. They are the medium. They're neither high nor low. When they're operating with sloops, they're the high mix. The high part of the high low mix. When they're operating with dreadnoughts, they are the low. They are very capable vessels, but they're in the middle. And it's often forgotten that it's important to have the middle. When we start to talk of a balanced fleet and a balanced force structure, that's when you start to hear mention of these sorts of ships. Often they're put in a sort of task force. Uh, They might be described as being picket capable. There is all sorts of things you can come up with to get around the fact that what you're describing is really not the high, high capital ship, but is also not the low, low presence and task force. This is just general security, extra firepower in the task force ship. All these vessels have value. All of them have use. The Chathams are pretty darn critical for that. They're good ships. So what have we got coming? Well, next week we have the Krona class of the Swedish Navy, I think. And this week we have the Selborne Fisher scheme. The integration and then deintegration of the executive and engineering branches, which is going to be fun. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm trying to keep this under the 55-minute part. And I think the sound was all okay. There were possibly a couple bits where it went a little bit funny, but... (sighs) Yeah. New tower soon. That's what all the money now is going towards. When I get back in and when I end of September, that is the hope. Buy all the stuff, build it, and put together a nice new tower so that I can do all this stuff without any issues. So thank you for all your support. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and... uh, Thank you.